Okay, so I'm going to get started. So today we're going to just talk about P5A. So hopefully at some point um, we'll make a video for you about P5B too. I don't think it really makes sense to do a discussion next week for that because um, that would be one day before the due date, so that probably wouldn't help much. Um, but yeah, still today is just for P5A. So how many people are, is, are most of the way done with it? Anybody? Okay. So uh, it, it's probably a significant amount of work, but hopefully no part of it is terribly complex, right? But there's kind of two big pieces to it. Uh, first, you have to build some sort of local file system layer, where basically you're storing files in one big file image, right? Most file systems uh, would store all their files on a disk, but you're just storing it in, in a different file. Okay, so that's kind of like the basic file server part. And so we, we've given you example, an example image for that with a few files in it. Um, and you can kind of dump that out. Uh, so maybe like the first thing you might want to try to do is you could just write some tools that uh, read that format. And, and I'll write a little bit of code like that today just to kind of get, get things rolling. Um, and kind of the way I would recommend you do this is you kind of do this independently of the network part. Right? Eventually the only way people will access this file system is via a client library that will communicate over UDP and then to read these uh, files on the local image, right? But uh, if, if you kind of try to debug all of that at the same time, it might be a lot of work, right? So you could imagine uh, writing some functions that look very much like the functions that we're going to expose, right? So here's, here's kind of like the client library. So over on the client side, we have all of these things. And normally, these are going to be causing network I.O. Uh, to read and write files. But you could imagine implementing these uh, functions locally, right? I mean, some of them wouldn't make sense like MFS and NET because what does a host name mean if you're just accessing a local file system? But if you kind of implement all these locally, you can uh, probably break down the problem and, and have an easier time. Uh, so we made some clarifications recently. Uh, in particular, uh, some of the people who have more networking uh, experience were, were kind of worried about the scope of the project. So kind of like the two common layers that people build on top of are either UDP or TCP. Uh, we didn't want to use TCP because uh, we were hoping to kind of like demonstrate the usefulness of an item potent server, right? So this is an item potent protocol, and uh, so you could just like retry anything, and it doesn't really matter, right? Whether you do it once or many times, you'll have the same result, right? So we didn't want to do TCP because TCP kind of already uh, suppresses duplicate messages, right? So we chose UDP. However, there's like a lot of other ugly things that UDP does in, in addition to dropping packets. Um, it can split up packets and reorder packets, and it's it's not really our intention to make you. Uh, deal with all that, right? So when we actually test your code, we're going to be testing it on a local machine, so those problems won't arise for you. So even though like, kind of we're using the UDP protocol, you can kind of assume that it's a little bit more reliable than what you might normally deal with if you are writing UDP code, right? So I mean, if you, if you go and take the networking class 640, you'll end up writing a layer that looks like TCP on top of UDP, and I mean, that's a massive project. It'd probably like take 30 hours in and of itself, right? So you can kind of just, just assume that your packets aren't going to get split up or reorder in any way. The only ca failure case you have to deal with is that, well, your server may crash, right? But also you have to deal with, uh, with the fact that packets may get dropped, right? So when the, when the client retries, that should not cause any problem. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So... I know at least one person went ahead and like started building a secure, um, a more reliable layer on, on top of that. So hopefully that didn't happen to too many people. Okay, so uh, the the file system image is kind of very similar uh, uh, to the XV6 file system. So I mean we'll look at that a little bit more, and then the client library. Basically, what you're going to have to do is for all of these calls, right? You're going to build a shared library like like you did for P3A. Uh, that's going to, to expose all these things, and each of them is really going to be some wrappers, right, that are going to take these arguments, say if I have a write, it's going to put this write data, this block number and all that into a packet, and then send the request. Uh, so basically, so I'm going to go over two things today. I'm just going to write some very simple UDP code, kind of give you a general idea how you might start building your protocol. And then second, uh, just to give you a flavor of uh, dealing with the on-disk format. I'm not going to actually uh, write that specific code, but I'm going to write some similar code uh, for kind of an FSCK uh, tool that does some very basic checking for file system consistency. Right, so what, what could be inconsistent in your file system? Uh, you might imagine you have this, these bitmaps for saying which blocks are allocated, and you also have inodes that refer to those same blocks, right? So if I have an inode that refers to a block, 
but it's not marked as allocated, that would be a contradiction. Right? So I'll write a little tool today that catches some uh, small things like that. Uh, you don't have to write such a tool, uh, although you'll probably be writing similar code to read these formats. Right? So most file systems would be either using a journal or a log to kind of prevent inconsistencies from happening, uh, but you don't have to do that. Right? And there's other file systems out there, like say ext2, that don't do that either. So any type of file system like that would actually would need an fsck utility uh, to deal with crashes. So any questions before we uh, before we jump in? Okay, so we've given you a fair amount of code here. So we, we gave you in particular uh, the, this UDP library. Uh, you, I mean, you can even look at it if you want, uh, but you shouldn't you shouldn't change any of this code. So one of the things that we're going to do is when we're testing your code, we're, we're going to replace this little library we gave you so we can inject faults. Right? We can kind of uh, uh, easily drop packets if we want, kind of simulate that, right? But um, so don't touch this. I mean, you can read it if you want. It, basically, there's just a lot of ugliness uh, for a lot of this network programming. This kind of wraps it up cleanly. So you end up with just these uh, these five calls. So as you as you probably recall, right? When we have these network channels, we have uh, two endpoints, one on each machine, and each endpoint is represented by a port number on that machine. So whether you're the client or the server, you're going to call this UDP open call uh, to kind of initialize your end of the connection, right? When you're the server, you want to be running at a well-known port number so that clients know where to find you. But if you're a client, it doesn't really matter what the port number is uh, because um, when you connect to the, uh, to the server, the server will know your port number. So it could be anything, right? The server will find out because the client reaches out to the server first, right? So what we're going to do is... Uh, uh, when we make both these connections, the server is going to specify a port that's uh, given on the fan line, and the client will just pass zero here so that it can be anything. Okay, And then ultimately we're going to be reading and writing to these. So this, this will return a file descriptor back, and then we're going to be reading and writing to these file descriptors. right? So this both read and write when we have the file descriptor, that uh, file descriptor is our endpoint, and then the other endpoint who we're communicating with is going to be in this, uh, this sock adder data structure. right? And what does that include? Uh, well, I guess you don't have to know what it includes because this fill sock adder will populate it for you, right? So you just have to give this a host name and a port, and you'll get a sock adder, right? So then you can have your endpoint, the file descriptor, and then the sock adder, the other endpoint that you're talking with. So but let's just write a little bit of this code uh, and see if it's making sense. All right, so on the client side, what, we're, what are we going to want to do? We're going to want to do all of these things, right? Hmm. So, so we can really we don't really care which one we end up using, but that's fine. Uh, so we're gonna close it when we're all done. And so let's let's just write a simple server now. That what what we'll do is the client will send an, an integer over to the server. The server will add one and then send that back. Okay. So ultimately, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be do a do a write first, and then do a read. Okay, and both of these are going to be on our file descriptor. That's all fine. I'm not really checking for errors here, but you should certainly be doing that uh, later. Uh, so, okay, let's get an integer here so we can have something to deal with. We'll say it's one, two, three to start with. Um, so when we want to send this thing, right, this is expecting a character buffer, right, which is it's just an array of bytes, right? And we can really kind of shove any any data structure we want into an array of bytes, right? We can just do a pointer to any memory, right? So when I do this, I'm going to get x, but then of course, uh, just to make the compiler happy, I'm going to end up casting that, okay? So that's what I'm going to do there. Uh, how much data do I need to read? Well, that's easy. I just want to read the size of an integer, right? Which is size of x. Okay, and then I have to deal with this sock adder, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm first going to define a sock adder, and I'm going to say that this is a server sock adder. Okay, and then I want to populate that. Uh, with the server's address. Well, first off, okay, so I have to pass it uh, an address to the server so it can populate that data structure. Uh, so a host name, I'll just call it localhost, right? That just refers to the same machine I'm running on, and then the port number, right? I'll have to use the same port number when I go over to the server. Okay, so now I have this server I can talk to, 
And when I do the write, I can give it that address. Okay. Now, now what I wouldn't really um, do here is for the read. So, so when I do a write, I have to give it a sock adder that's already populated, right? So it knows to where to send the data. When for read, actually though, uh, UDP read is actually populating a sock adder itself to tell me who the message came from, right? So I don't really have to use uh, an initialized sock adder here. I'll just say other, right? And I mean, of course, other will be the server, uh, but, but this is fine for now, right? Oh, then I should make that addresses. Okay. So, and I'm also going to print this out, what it is before and after. Okay, so we kind of have our client working there. Uh, we kind of write an integer and then we read an integer back and uh, that should be incremented, right? So now we can go write our server code. Let me just make sure that this is all compiling quick before I bother to copy that. Okay, so perfect. Uh, so let's go over here and write some similar code now. Okay, and now, now I don't really have to, uh, I'm not going to have that client, and I don't have to populate anything like this beforehand. Uh, I will have to have an X, right? So in, in this case, what am I going to do? Uh, the server is kind of waiting for contact from the client, so I'm actually going to read first. Okay, and so I'm going to read from, well, I'll call this client. And then I'll write back to the same client this time. I'm going to write back what uh, X has become. Okay, so this is, notice that when I'm passing this client here, I, I never actually bothered to initialize it because uh, the read is going to initialize it to tell me who this who I'm reading from, right? I could end up reading from anybody that sends me a message. Okay, and then I guess the other thing I have to do here is I have to open up a particular uh, port number, right? So the, the, the client initialized its sock adder to use port 12345 as its destination. So here I better be listening on port 12345, right? I didn't have to do that for the client because um, nobody needs to really know what the client's port is um, unless, unless they're responding to the client. Right? And at that point, right, so this read will populate the client's address here, so then the write will use that same thing, so it will know. Okay, so let's, let's try this and see if it works. So I'll run the server here. So the server, so you see it's just running, it's waiting, right? It's waiting because there's nothing to read, so it's waiting for some read to come in. So I'm going to run my client over here. Oops, and then, okay, so I actually have a small bug in my server. I never incremented x. So let me run this again. Okay, my server is running. And then uh, we, we see that we can send a request to the server and get a response. Okay, and, and I, I mean, if, I, if, we, if this were a networking course, right, we'd have to do a lot of other things. We'd have to um, worry what would happen if, this, if, if the packet got split up, right, and it would return part of the message with one read and then like there was more data for another read and we'd have to figure out how to piece that together and suppress duplicates, but you don't have to worry about that for this this course, right? So um, so any questions so far? Okay. So let me let me think I have a note of here things I want to talk about here. Mm. Okay, so yeah, so let me go on to the next thing. So this is just kind of like a very simple situation, right? So what, what you're ultimately going to want to do is you're going to send some sort of message over uh, to the server that contains a lot of information, right? So uh, maybe I can, actually, I think I have this somewhere else. Okay, so we can define uh, some sort of message structure, like a request here, and then also a response. And generally what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to have some sort of type uh, for your request so that uh, it might be like the first thing you read off on the, on the server side so you kind of know what you're supposed to do, right? And, and kind of like the, the easy thing to do, which is fine for this project, is that you could just have one, uh, one structure for all your requests and just throw all your fields in there whether or not you use them, right? I mean, that's going to be very inefficient, right? Because let's say we have a write 
there's a lot of data there. So we'd have to have a uh, one of the fields would have to be a four kilobyte char array, right? And so I mean that's like just wasted stuff over the network if you're just sending say like a stat. But that's fine. That's just kind of like the quick and easy thing to do, right? But regardless, you're gonna want to send some sort of type so you know how to interpret the structure. Okay. But anyway, so I've defined these structures, <coughs> and we basically want to send these over the network. Okay. So I'm gonna go change our code now, and on the client. So we're actually going to have, I may have both of these on both ends. Let me just clean this up quick. Okay, so I'll have a request and a response. Okay, so what we can do now, so I'm going to get rid of X. We don't need X anymore. Uh, maybe it's easier if I write it, do it like this. Yeah, it's a little bit more readable. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to populate this, this request. Mm, I guess I can do that right here. <coughs> Excuse me. So we'll say x equals uh, 400 and y equals 157. And we should also say that we're, we want to add these things, right? Okay, we don't need that anymore. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so now instead of uh, instead of sending X, right, we can just send do the exact same thing, right? We'll just send the send that the address of that request, and then uh, we know what size it is as well, right? So that should be very straightforward. Well, actually, no, that's not true, right? So we've sent the request, but the server's going to send us back a response, right? So we don't want to read the exact same thing. We want to this time read a response, and then that should be what we want. Okay, so we'll send these, this pair of integers <coughs> in the structure over the wire, and then we'll read back a response. Okay, so let me just check quickly that compiles still. Oh, and it does not. Uh, oh, and that's because I haven't included common. Okay, so that compiles. Um, so now we can also uh, similarly, I'm going to go back to the client and grab that code. So we have these guys. And now I'm going to go over to the server and paste that code instead of X. Right? So now over here, what we want to do, so before we wrote a request, no, before we wrote a request and then read back a response, now we're, on this side, we're reading a request and writing back a response. Right, so I can I can grab that request here, and then I may be sending back a response. And what what I can probably do is I want to figure out what the type is, right? So if my request.type equals add, then I may do one thing. Then I'm going to uh, I'm going to basically so if you recall, oh, sorry, I'll split this way. Right, so we just want to populate this, this char array here. So if it's add, then we'll print to that. We have response.message, and uh, we'll, we can just say something friendly like sum is percent %d. Okay, and then what, what, what is that? Well, we have uh, what x was and what y was. Okay, so we can just send that back. But otherwise, I mean, let's say we get some requests we don't aren't familiar with. We might, might want to send some back, some error of some sort. So, uh, request type. Okay. All right. So we read the request, and then we populate our response data structure, and then we send back the response. All right. So let me run this quick. And the client will, oops, what happened there? Oh, so I, I forgot the client never actually prints out what the message is. Okay, so we actually read that, and I should print out. All right, and then I can just say what the, what the response was, which was message. 
the server is running, and uh, uh, we see that we get our number back. Right? So that's great. And then if, if we, of course, uh, if we send it uh, some garbage type, it wouldn't work, right? So pretty much what you what you're going to want to go do, kind of relating this back uh, to the project, is you're probably going to want to define a structure for your requests that has kind of every possible uh, field for any of these that you might have, and then assign each of these different calls a different um, type number, right? So you can just send that same packet every time with that request, and then the server side can know how to do that. I mean, that's very efficient. This is kind of very bad network code, right? But it's, it's fine for the purposes of this class. It's not a networking class. Okay, so any questions so far? Yeah? What's that? Yeah, exactly, right? So what's going to happen is, like, let's say you sent that message to the server, and they never sent you the response back, then you, after a certain amount of time, you should send, uh, send that request again. And I can, um, so we have some hints on the web page about how to use select, and I'll, I'll write some code like that today to kind of give an example. Well, other, other questions? Okay, so let me, let me head back here to the code quick. Let me just, uh, I mean, I kind of mentioned that this is really bad code, right? So I just want to uh, kind of tell you um, the ways in which it's bad so you at least know. So one of the things that's bad about it is that I'm just using integers here, right? And I mean some machines, I mean most machines are going to be little Indian, right? The least significant byte will come first, but maybe there's some machines that are big Indian, right? So right now I haven't really written uh, uh, cross-platform code, right? I mean if I compile this on different machines, uh, that would be garbage, right? So I mean if you're, if you're doing this more seriously, you'd uh, have to write some functions that can convert to the same Indianness. I mean, it's usually a big Indian over the network, and everybody would do that, right? So that's one thing. The other thing that's kind of uh, maybe you ran into this if you were trying to optimize your malloc program, but when, when I have these structs, they aren't necessarily uh, the exact size I want. So let, let me just give an example here quick. Uh, so I'm going to add a character here, right? So I, I'd expect what would the, the size of this should be? This should be 4, 8, 12, 13, right? That's what I might anticipate. Let's see what it actually is. Uh, and I want the size of struct. Okay. So I'm going to print off, off what that size is, right? I'm expecting it to be 17. Is that in the client code? Or, or no, I was expecting it to be 13, right? Let me, let me just pull it up again. Right, it should have been 13, right? I should have had 4, 8, 12, 13, but it ended up being 16. Basically, the compiler is trying to make everything word aligned just so uh, you can access it faster, right? So you can imagine another nasty situation if, I just had, if I'm kind of uh, sending these structs over the wire, what if the person on one machine compiled with one compiler and uh, they made it, they kind of blew up the size of this from uh, 13 to 16 to make it fast, and then maybe somebody on another compiler uh, kind, of, kind of packed it in so it was only 13 bytes to save space, right? You could kind of imagine all kinds of issues where it wouldn't be the same, right? So one of the things that, uh, that you would do in that case is you can tell the compiler um, that it should pack it tightly and not add extra fluff for efficiency. So you can actually, um, so, so the TAs uh, kindly released this, some example code. I think this is more than people got last year for it, uh, but they actually suggested um, a message format for you. Uh, and I haven't even played with this. I'm not sure how you would use all of these things. I'm not really sure what command is. Um, but I mean, you could use this as an example or, or use anything you want, right? But you can see that they're uh, kind of passing this uh, hint, this attribute to GCC telling it that you should pack this tightly, uh, don't leave any extra uh, space, enter the structure to make it more efficient, right? So a lot of people on the malloc project, when they're, if they were trying to be competitive, they, this was one of the things they'd do, right? Just to uh, make their structures fit more tightly. So any questions on that? Okay, so let me see what else do I want to talk about here. Okay, so I kind of talked about uh, the cross-platform stuff. Yeah, so now, uh, yeah, he had asked about 
how we're going to deal with timeouts, right? Because how that's basically we want to be able to retry, right? And we don't know to retry unless we haven't done a response for a certain amount of time, right? So kind of let's draw it back to our client. We have this read here, right? We don't. Uh, we only want to wait for this read. Well, first let me actually just show you something. Hmm. Okay, I'm just trying to run the client by itself. There's no server running. And you see it just hangs there forever, right? Because nobody's responding to it. It doesn't even know, right? So we just have to, our goal, I'm not trying to write all the retry code. I'm just trying to show you how to make that actually, actually time out. Next, I can also clean up this while I'm at it. Okay, so, so the call, oops. The call we suggested is the select call. And kind of the, the idea of select, right, is like you often have these file descriptors. I mean, they could be any, anything. They could be these pipes, sockets, uh, for actual regular file system files, anything, right? And sometimes it takes a long time to read from them. Uh, select, what it'll do is it'll kind of let us wait on a bunch of them at the same time, and it'll tell us when any one of them is ready, right? So we don't have to wait on a particular one. We can wait on all of them. And another feature it has is, is you can give it a timeout. So it'll say that even if none of the file descriptors we give it, uh, are ready after a certain amount of time it'll return, right? So that's kind of, so it has, you can see it has multiple features, right? Wait on multiple file descriptors and also have a timeout. We're only going to use a timeout, right? So when we look at this call, uh, it kind of has a lot of stuff in here you aren't going to use, right? So you're going to use it in a much simpler way. Basically, you can give it a set of file descriptors you're waiting on and your set of file descriptors will only contain one file descriptor and then you can specify a timeout for it. Okay, uh, we don't really care about write file descriptors or also these uh, exception file descriptors. I don't even know what that is. Um, but, but the write file descriptors are interesting, right? Uh, first off, when might we block for a write file descriptor? Yeah, exactly. I mean, in the common case, like the vast majority of the time, we'll just immediately send it over the network, but if, if our write buffers are full, we might have to wait a while, right? Um, so in that situation where all our write buffers are full, the, I mean, it's not really appropriate to retry, right? Because we're just waiting our turn, we know that. Um, so the appropriate thing is to just wait, right? So that's why we aren't gonna use these uh, specify any write file descriptors. We're just gonna specify this. And if you read through this documentation, uh, you also have this n uh, FDS argument, which is it's a very strange API, but basically this has to just be one greater than uh, the maximum file descriptor in any of your sets. Right? I have no idea why they did that. It's very, very strange. Because I mean, they could have figured it out themselves, right? But um, I'm, I'm sure they have a good reason for it. So anyway, so let's actually try using this code. So we see we have to pass it this FD set. And we actually have some helper functions here, or maybe these are actually macros. And basically the FD0, uh, that just makes a set so it has zero elements in it. It just clears the set. And then we can add things to it with FS set um, or clear. These are really the only two that you need to use, just zeroing it out or adding something to it. Okay, so let me, let me just grab all this code here and we can play around. Oh, just, just on the side, if you want to read more on this, uh, so I mean, we have this man page, right? Uh, but down at the end, you actually see that uh, they put a select tutorial in a different man page, the select toot. So I can also, uh, there's a lot more information on there if you want to uh, read it in more detail. Okay, it kind of explains these arguments a bit more. Okay, but anyway, so, uh, we're over on our client, right? And what do we need? So here's where we want to read, right? We want to kind of make this read uh, have a timeout for it. So we're going to need a few of these things. We need the select, of course. Okay. And uh, I'll just say ready. So select returns the number of file descriptors that are ready, which in our case will either be uh, zero or one because we only have one file descriptor that we're waiting on. Uh, so a lot of these things we can, I'm just going to set all these things for null now to make it a little bit more clear. Uh, OK, 
Okay, so these are the main arguments we have right now. Uh, so we have to uh, set it, pass in one of these FD sets, right? So I can just create an FD set, and uh, I'll just call this FDs. And so the first thing I should do is initialize it, which is straightforward, and then I can add something to it, right? So, uh, so I've used that one. So basically I'm adding which file descriptor do I want to add? Uh, well, basically this one, right? This, this FD, my endpoint of the socket, is what I'm waiting on. Right, so I'll just add FD to that. Okay, so now I have this, and now I'm waiting. And so what is this thing? Just remember that it's, it's one plus the maximum. So in that case, since we only have one, the maximum is clearly just that. Okay, and then we have, uh, we pass in our FDs here. Okay, and at this point I'm not even I'm not even setting a timeout, right? We'll do that next. Uh, but but the, what we can basically do here is we can say if ready equals one, uh, then we'll actually try reading from it. Otherwise, I mean, eventually you'll have to do a retry, right? But I'm not going to do that uh, today. I'm just going to uh, kind of set an error here. Okay, let me just make sure this is still compiling and running. Right, so I mean, this this does not really fix anything yet. Oh, uh, and I forgot uh, to take a reference of that. So basically, I had to. I think I have to pass a pointer there. Okay, so now it's happy, and I'll run my server, and then let me see over here. I'll run my client, and the client's fine. And of course, if I run the client again, it's still going to hang forever because I haven't set a timeout yet. Right, so it still hangs forever because no server is running to respond to it. If you recall the way I wrote this, the server just exits as soon as it does one response. Okay, so that server, uh, the client's just hanging forever. So now we can introduce, um, we can introduce a timeout. Okay, and that's what this is basically going to be over here. Uh, if we go back to this man page, uh, maybe I will go to the tutorial. I think there was more useful information in here. Uh, they they talk about. Uh, you're basically giving it uh, one of these uh, time valves where you basically specify uh, how many seconds plus how many uh, microseconds, right? So it's kind of like the sum of these, right? So I can, I may want to give it one of these, and then that's what the argument will be, okay? So I'm over here now again. Uh, let me paste this. So I'll just call this TV for time, time val, and then... I want to set these things for it. So I'll say I'm going to wait for 3.5 seconds. So how long is 3.5 seconds? Well, I have this uh, USEC as well. And so I'll set that to, uh, I, I believe that's half a second, right? Because that's 500,000 microseconds. All right, so now I have this nice times, time value, and I can pass that uh, into select, right? And then let's try running that and see what happens. So that's happy. The server runs. And then over here, I'm going to run the client. And I'm going to run time in front of it to actually see uh, that it's waiting for the time amount of time I expect. Oops. Oh, well, it was already running. OK, so now I'm going to run it. Uh, so the server was running, so it, it returned immediately, which is good, right? Select should do it. I'm going to run it now again while the server is not running. Right? The server is done now. So this should wait for 3.5 seconds. Okay, that's exactly what it does. So any questions on that? Let me bring up the code quick so you can kind of stare at it and, and, and see. So, all right, so let me see. So that's kind of everything about the networking side, right? So if you have any more questions about the networking side, now would be a good time to ask before I start talking about uh, the storage side of things. Uh, yeah. Right? What's that? Like if there is no response, then you try. Right. So you can imagine something like that, right? I'm kind of. I could put all this on a loop, right? So I mean, if, if the select, right? So I mean, I could. I could have. I'm not going to write the whole code, right? But I may have some sort of uh, uh, loop, and within that loop, I'm going to have to. Uh, uh, well, I'm gonna, let me just, uh, 
Well, I'm just trying to not actually finish this, but I, I, so I would do the write first, right? And then kind of, uh, I, I would do the read, right? And kind of in this error case, uh, well, in this case, I would kind of break out, right? And then, uh, I mean, I'm not going to like write this because you can kind of think about how you want to do it, right? You might want to have some sort of, uh, uh, you might maybe update the TV uh, for exponential back off, right? Right, so that you don't overload the server, right? Every time you retry, you kind of wait longer. Right, so that kind of makes sense. So yeah, once you have once you have the timeout, that's ninety percent of it, right? And then kind of like doing the retry is just a little bit of extra work. Yeah. Um, I, I, I forget what the spec says, but I'm pretty sure you just retry forever. Um, yeah, I don't think really, really say, so I think it's reasonable to just retry forever. Right? I mean, what else are you going to do, right? Other questions about this code? Okay, so let's go over and look a little bit at the at the disk images that you've been given. Uh, right, so now we're, we have some local code. Let me see here. Okay, so I, I want to actually introduce you to some tools uh, for kind of dealing with these kinds of binary uh, files. So, I mean, if you have some tool like CAD or your editor or whatever, they're just trying to try to dump out or print everything in this file. And that's not very help helpful, right? Because it's not really text, right? So kind of like the couple things we want to do is we want to be able to just grab out a piece of a file to look at, say, a particular block. And we also want to be able to kind of view the hex for that instead. Okay, so first let's, uh, I, I have a bunch of images here because I'm going to implement a simple uh, FSCK. Uh, but this was the image that the TAs gave you. And... What format is, in, is that in? Let me pull that up quick. I think I have that in my notes. So the for, format is this. Basically, uh, it's broken into four, K by, uh, four kilobyte blocks. Uh, the first block is empty. Um, I don't know for sure why they did that. My guess is that they're just trying to make it a little bit more friendly in case you have some sort of bug. So you don't, I mean, if they put the super block there and then you accidentally write to block zero, um, it seems like a more likely mistake than writing to accidentally writing to block one. All right, so I'm guessing they just put that there for safety, and you have a super block, then inodes, and then a data bitmap, and then everything for and beyond is data blocks. Right, so the data blocks may contain regular file data, or they may contain directory entries. Right. So basically, what I'm going to do first is I want to look at, see how if I just uh, didn't want to really write any code, but I kind of wanted to browse through this binary file and see what was in the data bitmap. So what I do is I, I would use this tool called a DD. And so this is this is just this converter copy a file. But basically what, what you can do is you can specify an input an output file. And then it has all these nice tools such as uh, I could say skip. Um, so at the start of input I could skip over a number uh, a number of uh, blocks. I can also sp specify somewhere uh, I can specify uh, how big a block is, and then also there's a count, so I can specify how many how many of these want. So if I pass all the right arguments in there, I can kind of create a file that is just one block in size and contains the data bitmap. Okay, so let me head over here and do that. So I'm going to do dd, and my input file is going to be uh, test.image, okay? And my output file, uh, I'll call that bitmap. Uh, block, okay, and my block size is maybe 4K, right, because that's what the file system is, and I only want one of these guys, and then the other thing is I need to skip, right, I, I forget how many I need to skip, but let me check that quick, uh, I wrote that in my code, okay, so I want to read the third, well, there's three blocks before here, right, I want to skip empty, skip super block, and skip inodes, so I'm going to skip three, Okay, so I'm going to run this, and it runs, and what do I have? Uh, and so 
Great, so I have this uh, bitmap.block and it's of the appropriate size, of course. All right, so I've just basically extracted that one block uh, from the test.image file. Okay, so now I actually want to read it, right? And if I, I, I could try just opening it, right? But it's just going to be garbage. Uh, at least it's going to look that way, right? So that's not very helpful. So what I would actually do is I'd run the hex dump tool on that bitmap, right? And so this is a little bit strange, but you see on the left, you have the offset within to that file. And then there's a star here basically showing that this, this data was repeated until the end. So there's basically a lot of, right, this is the address and this is the data. So there are just basically a lot of zeros except for this first part, right? Now this is actually a little bit confusing, right? It looks like it's 00FC, uh, but it's actually not. For whatever reason, hex dump by default wants to treat the file as a bunch of uh, two-byte integers or shorts. Right, so and it's kind of assuming that it's a little Indian, so it's kind of switching around here. So I mean, if you have, kind of want to get a more reasonable output, uh, you, there's different flags. You can read the man pages for that. But I might run hex dump dash capital C. And now I actually see something more reasonable. Right, so I see that my block starts with FC, and then it's all zeros for the whole rest of it. Okay, and so what does this mean? That means uh, well, f that's one 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 one, and then c is one one oh oh. So basically, what what I could, if I was just trying to read this, I would I would see that my data bitmap has allocated the first six data blocks, and then everything after that is free. Does that make sense? You can kind of use these tools to dig through and kind of check your assumptions, right? Uh, you can kind of make sure you're because uh, you're going to write some code that's going to read this bitmap, right? But how do you know if that code is correct or if the image is wrong or anything, right? You'd use this to double check that. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, so let's write some code now then that will check these images uh, for corruptions, right? So you don't have to write any code like this, but uh, hopefully it'll still, I mean, you could write code like this, right? To make sure that uh, your file system isn't corrupting the on-disk image, right? To kind of check for bugs, but you don't have to, right? I'm just going to write this code because you have to write kind of similar code, but I don't want to write exactly what you're writing. Okay, so. Uh, kind of where to start, uh, there's this mfs.h file. It's kind of an ugly file, right? They do a lot of strange things, like they say the number of indirect is 13, and then they add it, add one to it down here, so it's actually 14. Um, I, I don't know why it's so ugly. I think they grabbed it, kind of pulled it out of uh, uh, XFS, or not XFS, uh, XV6, so I kind of probably got, uh, uh, there's pr probably some justification for a lot of this, but you don't have to understand a lot of this. But basically it's nice because you kind of have uh, on-disk structures that correspond to the image that was given you, right? Like you have your directory entries. Oh, so this is an, this stat is not actually on-disk, but that's a response type. But this directory entry would be on-disk. Uh, what else do we have on-disk here? Uh, we have an inode data structure. Oh, so they call their inodes this, the inode, right? So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to read all the inodes in, and I'm going to read in all the data bitmaps, and then I can compare them, right, to see if, uh, if, if say, the data bitmap says something is allocated but nobody points to it. I know that that's just like wasted space, right, and I should probably fix it. Okay, so I have to deal with this. So I'll just read this in first. Uh, also, I want the super block. Uh, So let me, oops, that's not what I wanted. Okay, so I need that. Uh, I just want a struct. I'm going to read in a bunch of inodes. I'm just going to figure out my data structures here and then kind of piece this code together. Uh, but somewhere I have a super block. Yeah, so I need this guy. And then there is no, there is no block for the bit, or there is no structure for uh, the bitmap, uh, you just have to interpret that yourself. Okay, uh, but okay, so I see this format, right? I have super block, inode, the data bitmap. So it's the first thing I'm going to do, right? I think it says on the directions that it recommends that you just read in all the metadata as soon as you start. I know it says at least for the super block and inodes, and I mean, there's no reason not to do it for the data bitmap too. So what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> um, I'm just trying to kind of have some space where I read all that at once. 
And actually, I don't want that to be a pointer because I need space for it. And so that would be 3 times b size. All right, so that's just the block size. So this is uh, 3 blocks. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just directly read to all that stuff as soon as I boot up. Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to make my other, other things point to that. I may have my inodes uh, point to the meta blocks. And, and that, that's going to be the second one, right? I'm not going to read an empty. So I, for this, I would just say 1 times b size. I want the address of that, right? So this is kind of inodes is just pointing into the meta blocks. Right, and kind of like the super block, I can do a similar sort of thing. Uh, so I have my super block, and that's just, I mean, that's the first one. Right, and then uh, I, I also have my bitmap, right, and that, that's just going to be uh, the, third, the third thing. Right, and then of course I also have to do some casting here to actually make this work. All right, so that's, that should kind of work, right? So kind of, I have all these things pointing to my meta blocks, and what I can do is, as soon as I boot up, I can just p-read all that in. All right, so let me let me just do a man on p-read so I can recall what that looks like. So you see I already have some code here, right? Like it takes a command line argument and opens that file, so that's going to be our image, and we kind of close it when we're done. So I, I just kind of had this so I wouldn't write that boring code uh, while you guys were watching. Uh, right, but I want to read meta blocks, and I want to read three kilobytes of it, or no, not three kilobytes, uh, three blocks of it, so three times block size, and my offset, well, I'm skipping, remember my format, I'm skipping this empty block at the beginning, right, so my offset should be one block, right? And then, to kind of just make sure that this actually did something, I'm going to print off uh, what my... I want to print off what's in the super block. Okay, so I'm just going to print off these two fields. The number of data blocks in the system and the number of inodes. Okay, so let me just... Okay. Oh no. And of course it's not happy because I didn't actually uh, do that. So now it's happy, right? It's just warning me that, that I have unused variables that I haven't used yet. So now if I actually run this thing, Oh no, I have to actually pass it an argument, which will be the test on image. Uh, sorry, I should actually add a new line here too. Right? I mean, don't, don't get lost in all this, right? We're just reading in these three, three metadata blocks, and we're just saying that the first one, uh, we're going to interpret that as a super block, right? So just do some casting, right? So don't get lost in the details. Um, but I run that now, I can see, okay, there's uh, 1024 data blocks and 64 inodes, right? So I mean, you might have an image with fewer, uh, fewer than that. Are there, are there any questions so far before we dive deeper? Okay, so we have that. So now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to read in, uh, I'm, well, I'm going to write some code so I can actually interpret this bitmap. Okay. And then I'm gonna basically what I'm gonna do is first off before I like do any sort of comparison, I'm just gonna uh, dump out all the inode information, all the bitmap information, and then we can write some FSCK checks. Okay, so I'm gonna just write read bit, and then we have to specify a bit number. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first say uh, I, I need to know which uh, which byte it is, right? So I can get that by dividing the bit by eight. And then, maybe returning something here, right? But then I actually have to figure out, uh, I have to figure out which of those bits I want, right? So I may have to and it. I might and it with something like this, right? To get uh, to get that third bit. So let me. I may ultimately have something that looks like this. I'm gonna shift it over, 
uh, what should I shift it over by? It would probably be something like this, right? It would be, uh, I may shift over by bit mod mod 8, right? So I mean, here here I, like by dividing by 8, I find the byte, and then uh, by modding by 8, I find the bit within that byte, right? But actually, kind of, they, they consider the, uh, the first bit, or the most significant bit, bit 0. So I just have to uh, do this. So this is kind of boring code, right, because you've written these bitmaps before, but um, I just know everybody's under a time crunch, right? So you might I don't, probably don't want to mess around with figuring out which bits correspond to which stuff, right? It might take a bit of uh, reverse engineering, so I'm just going to help you out here. Okay, so, so we have that, so we can just read uh, any particular bit and find out what it is, right? Okay, so let me... Uh, let me down here now, right? So I can I'm I'm reading this again. I mean it's ultimately in meta blocks because the bitmap points to that. So I can just loop over all of these if I want now. So what I'll what I'll do is I know how many data blocks there are. So I can just say i equals zero i less than that and so on. Okay, I'll loop over every possible one and I'll just figure out whether or not it's allocated. Right? So I'll say if read bit i, uh, and I'll say all right. So let me run this. Okay, and I see that uh, this is great, right? Remember when I did the hex dump? I saw FC and then a bunch of zeros that implied six ones and then all zeros, right? And that's exactly what I see here, right? The first, the first six data blocks are allocated and nothing else is, right? So I know that my read bit code is correct. Okay, so that's good. So now the thing we want to check that against is we want to check that against uh, the inodes, right? So I mean, I should have exactly one inode uh, referencing each of these things, okay? So for that, I can write a very similar loop, uh, but now I want to loop over the inodes, right? And then, of course, within each inode, I want to loop over. I want to loop over each of the fourteen entries, right? So, so I'm going to do that. And what am I going to do now? Uh, I only want to print off if it's a valid reference. And so how do I tell that? So this is kind of another weird thing they did. Uh, the addresses are unsigned. So how do they store a garbage address? They do that by storing the biggest possible integer. Right? So, I mean, it's kind of, if it were signed, it would be negative one. Uh, but, but it's not that. So what I would do is I would check if, uh, let me read this guy. So I have, okay, so I have my inodes here. So, and it's inode i, right? And I want to say adders, and the adder is j. If that's not equal to, so the biggest integer is just not zero, right? So I mean, this is flipping all the bits to one, right? So if it's not invalid, then I can actually print something out. Okay, so let's run this again. Oh no. Uh, has no member named inodes. Yeah, because I think it was n inodes, right? I run it again, and I see, oh, well, this is good. I can kind of on visual inspection see that this is consistent, right? Because I have, have my six that are allocated, and the exact same six uh, are referenced. Well, actually, no, that's not true at all, right? Because here I'm pointing out i, which is just a coincidence that it's the same thing, right? I actually, what I should have done is I should have printed off this address here. Sorry for that. So let me try this again. And uh, this is a good, good thing I caught this because this is actually kind of a weird point. Uh, you see that for whatever reason, you'd, you'd expect these inodes to have uh, to have addresses of blocks, they just have block numbers in them. But for whatever reason, they have uh, they have these uh, just byte offsets, 
right? And not only that, but it's also weird because these byte offsets refer um, to the offset within the total image, so it's kind of not counting the four at the beginning, right? So if I kind of wanted to normalize this so it's consistent with the bitmap, what I'd have to do is I'd have to divide by B size, and that's not totally correct yet, but let me just show you, right? So now I see that, yeah, let, me, let me add some space in between here. I realize I'm probably giving giving a lot away, but I, I just feel like uh, it'll probably save you some time in the end, right? So, so I mean, now you can see that all these references it starts at four, right? Which is in agreement with this layout, right? Blocks four and beyond are data blocks, right? So the zero, so the zero entry in this bitmap corresponds to the fourth block in the file system. Okay, so if I actually, actually want to do a fair comparison between these, I would probably then actually subtract off four, right? And now I can actually run this again, and then I, I can see, oh no, I didn't make. Then I can actually see that what is allocated is the same as what is referenced. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to check kind of do four sanity checks on these. I, I first want to make sure that all of these references are, are two valid locations within uh, the file system. I want to make sure I never have two references pointing to the same data block. Well, what, 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 what's wrong with having two references pointing to the same data block? So, so, I mean, so you could imagine that in some cases you might want that, right? I mean, if I want to save space and the data is the same, right? But you'd only want that if you kind of had a copy on write file system, right? Because if I have two references to the same data block and one of those files get modified, then the other file will also get modified too, which is probably not, not what you want, right? So, I mean, in this case, you don't have a copy on write file system. So, I'm going to check for that. So, the double references. And then I'm going to just uh, check for contradictions between the inodes and, and the bitmaps, okay? So the way I'm going to do that is that I have, uh, so I'm iterating over all the references, right? So I'm just going to keep a bunch, a big array of uh, ref counts. Uh, how big? Uh, that's going to be the number of blocks, right? And I'm going to just initialize that to zero. Okay, so I have that big array um, that's all initialized, and so then I can do a bunch of, of counts now. So I can basically say every time I have one of these references, I can say that ref counts of, well, this is my address, right? Well, first, let me just actually put that in a separate thing. So here's, here's the kind of like normalized block address, right? And I can say that block, uh, Somebody references it, right? And then I can do checks here. I can say that if, uh, if that is greater than one, right? So then there's a double reference, right? So that's one type of error. All right, so that's one of our four checks. The other check I should have probably done, I mean, I probably shouldn't even add this if the block is insanely large, right? Because it might be too big or too small. So I should actually check if is less than zero, or if it's greater than or equal to uh, the maximum block. Well, I mean the max, right? So I mean, well, the number, if it's greater than or equal to the number of blocks, right? That means it's one past the end, right? So uh, then I can actually say, I'll, I'll do another message and just say that uh, ref out of range Okay, so here are my two, two checks, right? So these are kind of, uh, for these, I don't even, uh, these are just basic sanity checks that don't even involve comparisons to the bitmap, right? So I'm just kind of building up this table, which I'll use for comparisons to the bitmap, and then kind of uh, just making sure that it's kind of self-consistent, right? That I don't have an insanely large number or any double references, 
All right, so those are, those are my first two checks. My other two checks, I'm going to compare against, so I have this ref counts now. I'm going to compare ref counts against uh, my bitmap, right? So here I'm iterating over, over every block in my bitmap. And there's kind of two cases that I could go wrong, right? So I mean, if the bitmap says it's unallocated, then what I, but it's not actually, if there's no reference to it, then that's a problem, right? So if the ref counts of i equals zero, uh, then I have a problem, right? So what, what, what does that actually mean? That means uh, unreferenced allocation, right? Because it's allocated in the bitmap, but there's, uh, there's no actual references to it, right? So that's a contradiction. Um, the other contradiction is similar. Uh, that it's kind of like the opposite case, right? Uh, if, if that bit equals zero, uh, but then there's more than one, uh, uh, but there's more than one um, reference to it, uh, then I can say that that's a reference to unallocated space. Okay, so let's let's actually see if this works. Oops. So that's on line 63. What doesn't it like here? Value computed not used. Oh, good call. That fixed one of my problems. Value computed, not used. Is it unhappy about it? What's that? Oh, good call. Okay, so that's that's happy now, at least it compiles. Uh, so now we can try test image, and of course it doesn't print anything out on test image because test image is correct. Uh, but I was messing around this morning just creating a bunch of, of bad images of various. Oh no, what did that do? Um, that was a bad reference. Well, let me try the other ones first and then we'll come back to that one. Uh, let's try the double reference and see if that one does. Okay, so, that, so yeah, when I do it on my corrupted image that has a double reference, that touches that one. Uh, let's do the missing allocation, right? So that's that's good, right? It's reference to uh, missing space. Let's just try the missing ref, right? So it's finding that one, and then so that was a three, right? So it, it's crashing on this one. Let me just uh, figure out what it's doing wrong quick. So that's crashing. It's probably because. Why would that be? Let me let me just figure out quick how far it's getting. So never it's crashing up here even. Uh Mm-hmm. Wait, what's that? Why do we have oh, yeah. Oh, good call. Yeah, definitely. That would definitely be the problem. Okay, good call. Hmm. Oh, no. I made it, right? If block is less... Oh, 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 yeah. I, I can only do the ref count down here. I see what you guys are saying. Yeah. Now it should be happy. Yep, okay. And then... It has one out of range. I'm not sure why it has others, but oh, I'm only oh that's because I'm only counting the double. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, uh, this is getting sloppy. Okay, I I want to increment the count if it's valid, but I don't want to just count it there. Okay, so now I should actually do the right thing. 
Okay, so it just does the ref hunt out of range. So, uh, so I mean, hopefully, I mean, I imagine like the that kind of like shows you how you can read and write these bitmaps, and you're gonna have to write similar code to that. Um, and hopefully, you have an idea for the network now. So, any questions before we wrap up? All right, that's it. So this may very well be our last discussion. Uh, we might do another video, but I don't think it makes sense to have a discussion next Thursday. I'll send out an email if there's anything else we need to cover that day, though. So, all right, that's it.